Okay, we're back with section 11.3. I'm going to be reading through the core concept boxes pretty quickly. There's a lot of text, um, which we definitely want to read through, but I'm going to do it really quickly so that we can focus more on the examples and the video doesn't get super long. So just know that as we go through this. Okay, so 11.3, collecting data. We're going to be looking at sampling methods and statistical studies. Um, I'm going to let you guys read that top box, but it's the type of samples that I do want to talk through um, in the video. So... We've got different types of samples, and depending on kind of what survey or what um, what we're trying to do, we might take different samples depending on you know what the outcome is we're looking for. So, types of samples: self-selected sample means that the population, the members of the population, can volunteer to be in that sample. It's optional. You can choose whether or not you want to take a survey, uh, for example. A systematic sample. That's next. This is maybe a rule that allows us to choose a person. So one example would be selecting every other person as they walk into a room. Next is a stratified sample. This is when we take a population, we divide it into smaller groups that share common characteristics, and then we randomly select from each of those groups. And then we've got a cluster sample. A cluster sample is when we divide the population into groups, but then we only take one of those groups. The last one doesn't have an image on this one. A convenience sample um, is kind of exactly how it sounds. We only take members of a population who are easy to reach. All right, so let's take a look at this first example. We just want to identify what type of sampling is being used in each of these scenarios. So. Example A, we list all students alphabetically and we choose every six students. So we've got a rule for how we're going to pick the students. We call this then systematic sampling. All right, part B, we mail questionnaires and only use the questionnaires that are returned. You have an option of completing the survey and then mailing it back. So this is an example of self-selected surveying, surveying or sampling. Okay, last few here. Part C, we ask all the students in your algebra class. Well, it's really convenient to ask your algebra classmates because you're already in algebra. We then call this a convenience sample. It's really easy to get a hold of them because you're already in class with them. D, we randomly select two students from each classroom. So they're already divided into classrooms. And we randomly select two students from each of those groups. This is the stratified sample example. We divide students into uh, in our school according to their zip codes. We select all the students that live in a single zip code. So we're dividing everybody into different groups and then we're only taking one of those groups to survey. So this is what we call a cluster sample. And then we've got the last couple of questions here. So question F asks us this. We want to determine or describe another way that we can um, use to obtain a stratified sample. So stratified sample, again, is where we divide our population into groups and then we take um, random samples from each group. So one way we could do this is use part E, divide into zip code. But instead of taking only one zip code, pick two people from each zip code instead. All right, so we divide the school into groups and then we pick two or however many people at random from each of those groups. Another thing we could have done is we could have divided the whole school by grade level and then taken representatives from each grade. There's different answers for that question. G is very similar. We want to describe another method we can use to obtain a self-selected sample. Um, that is like setting up a voting booth at lunch. You have the option of using your lunchtime to go vote. Um, you could do an online survey. Again, different options for G as well. Okay, moving on. Bias in sampling is a very big thing. Um, if you ever become a statistician, that's something that's going to be really important in your life. Um, but a bias can lead to misrepresentation of a population. So we always want to make sure we're taking unbiased samples in order to get a better representation of the information. Um, a random sample can help us reduce the possibility of a bias sample. So here's what we're doing for this example. We want to identify the type of sample and explain why it's biased. 
So in example 2A, we have a news organization asking viewers to participate in an online poll about bullying, and we want to know why this is biased. So let's talk about what kind of survey this is first. This is a self-select sample. It's not representative of the viewing population necess uh, necessarily. Those who self-select are more likely to have stronger opinions. So if you think about that, um, like in customer service with, um, like if you go shopping at a store and they give you like a customer survey on the receipt, you're probably more likely to go online and fill out that customer survey if you've had a really, really bad experience or probably less so a good experience, but a lot of people have, if they have really, really strong opinions, like a really bad shopping experience, that is when you become way more likely to go and actually complete the surveys. So that's why these are kind of biased. I'm gonna just write those who self-select have stronger opinions typically. So it's not generally representative of the population of the viewers. All right, part B, we've got this. A computer science teacher wants to know how many stu or how students at a school uh, most often access the internet. And the teacher asks students in one of the computer science classes. So again, think about what type of sample this is. This is a convenience sample. It's easy for the teacher to um, ask her own computer science students because they're already sitting in class. So this is biased because it's not representative of the whole school. Um, it doesn't ask students and other classes who maybe don't even take computer science. Another answer could be it doesn't represent the whole school because students in computer science might be more likely to have a computer at home so that they can do their homework, things like that. So um, that's just one of the ways we can answer that question. Example three, we have... Um, this question, we're a member of the school's yearbook committee. We want to pull members of the senior class to find out what theme of the yearbook we should use. There are 246 students in the senior class. Describe two methods for selecting a random sample of 50 seniors to poll. Okay, I'm just going to talk through this. I'm not going to write the answers down. It's on the answer key online. Um, one way, maybe I'll write some of this down. Poll 50 names from a hat or a well-mixed bowl. So put every student's name in the bowl on a piece of paper, mix it around really, really well and pull 50 names at random. Another way that we could do this would be to assign every student a number from one to 246. And then generate 50 random integers using a computer or a calculator between one and 246. And those are your 50 random students being selected. Right, different options there, a lot more answers to if you can come up with one. All right, analyzing methods of data collection. Last page of the notes here, and, uh, and then we're done. An experiment, there's different ways that we can analyze methods of data collection. We've got experiment, observational study, a survey, or a simulation. Um, and these are four things that actually um, you'll use a lot later on if you go into statistics and things like this. So an experiment is something that we do to our sample population. So it can be a medical treatment um, or changing something or affecting a variable in our experiment so that we can measure whatever we're looking at. Observational study means we're just observing. We are not experimenting, we're not changing anything, we're just looking to see what happens generally over the course of time. A survey is when we ask members of a sample population different questions or things like that. And then a simulation oftentimes is where we're going to use a computer in order to create certain variables or real world situations that allow us to and then allow us to conduct essentially an online or through computer simulation of what would happen. Um, we generally use simulations when um, it's too difficult or dangerous or unethical to um, conduct the experiment in real life. Okay, so a really quick explanation, trying to make the video pretty quick. 
All right, example four, second to last example here. We want to know um, what method of data collection is being used in each situation. So example A, a researcher records whether people at a gas station use hand sanitizer. The researcher is only observing, we're not doing anything else. So this is observational. Part B, a researcher uses a computer program to help determine how fast an influenza virus might spread within a city. Well, computer program generally means we're using a simulation. Part C, members of student council at your school ask every eighth student who enters the cafeteria whether they like the snacks in the school's vending machine. We are taking a survey of the population. A park ranger measures and records the heights of trees in the park as they grow. We're not doing anything to the trees. We are just measuring their heights over a course of time. This is observational. And then last one, a landscaper fertilizes 20 lawns with regular fertilizer and 20 lawns with new organic fertilizer, and then they compare the lawns after 10 weeks. They have conducted an experiment. Okay, last question. I'm going to let you guys read that text there, recognizing bias. What we want to do is we want to identify the bias in each of these questions and then fix that. So last example, a dentist surveys his patients and asks, do you brush your teeth at least twice per day and floss every day? We want to know why this question might be biased um, and then fix it. So why is this question biased? Well, I don't know about you, but I'd be a little bit afraid to tell my dentist that I don't brush my teeth twice per day and floss every day if that wasn't true. So one way that this could be biased is those that have other routines might not want to admit that to their dentist, especially if they don't feel like it matches what their dentist wants them to do. Um, so one way we could fix this is the dentist could ask a more general question. What is your daily dental care routine? That allows um, for better feedback Another way that you could do it is ask anonymously. So have the patient fill out a form, put it in a box without their name on it, something like that. All right, last one, part B. Should the town build a playground and a dog area in the park on Main Street? We want to know why this might be biased. Well, if we look at this example, there's actually two questions in one. Should we build a playground and dog area? in the park on Main Street? If you answer yes to that question, are you answering yes to the playground or to the dog park? Um, so it doesn't necessarily represent um, answers for wanting a playground and no dog park or a dog park and no playground. Um, so the better way that we could ask this question is actually to separate it out into two. Ask, should we build a park on Main Street or a playground on Main Street? And then separately, should we build a dog area on Main Street? All right, email me if you guys have any questions. Um, make sure that this homework is in on time. Good luck. We'll see you later.